This program is brought to you by Emory University. Stephanie Wang will be presenting today. She's one of our third year fellows going into EEP. She's a native of Gwinnett County, did undergrad at MIT, uh, Wash U for med school, and Hopkins for residency. So uh, thanks, Steph. Let's get started. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, today I'm going to talk about a case presentation of PRKG2 cardiomyopathy. Okay, so the outline, we'll first start with the case that I encountered in the CCU last year, followed by an introduction about the, this particular cardiomyopathy. Then we'll talk briefly about the genetics and the pathophysiology of the disease, followed by the clinical syndrome as can be seen on EKG, echo, MRI, as well as the differential cardiomyopathies with this. And then we'll end with management and potential reversibility. So this is a case um, that I had last year. It's a 26-year-old gentleman with PRKG2 mutation, cardiomyopathy, with EF of 20%, WPW, SAS post ablation, prosismal AFib complicated by thromboembolic CVA, SAS post catheter thrombectomy, was transferred from EUH after presenting to the outside hospital with ICD shocks and VT storm. He has a pretty long past medical history for a 26-year-old. He was initially diagnosed with HOCAM in 2008 and received ICD at that time. And then he was evaluated at CHOA with genetic testing and found to have a mutation in the PRKG2 gene. He then underwent surgical myomectomy in 2014, at which time he had a 44 millimeter interoceptal wall and the 35 millimeter posterior wall, um, same of both anterior and posterior leaflets and the peak LV gradient 110 at rest. A couple years later, he underwent a pathway in AV nodal ablation for WPW syndrome and a CRT upgrade. And then a couple years after that, he had an unfortunate embolic CVA um, with catheter-directed thrombectomy, after which he had minimal residual deficits. And then he had an, another accessory pathway ablation about a year prior to presentation. So his brief hospital course at the other hospital, he presented after he received multiple ICD shocks while watching TV at home. He was on amiodarone infusion at the other hospital. However, <clears throat> developed recurrent ICD shocks, and so he's placed on a lidocaine infusion. He underwent a left heart cath at the time, which showed angiographically normal coronaries. And then he was transferred to EUH for VT storm, cardiogenic shock, and evaluation for a uh, heart, heart transplant. And this is his EKG at the ho other hospital. As you can see, it's a very fast echocardia, Y complex around 200 beats per minute, all consistent with VT. So on arrival to EUH, um, his vitals were relatively stable. Um, he was setting 96% on three liters. His physical exam, he was alert and oriented, but pretty flat affect. He had elevated filling pressures on his swan. Um, he came in on amiodarone and lidocaine infusion. And his labs were notable for a leukocytosis to 17, a hemoglobin of 13.5, an INR that was elevated at 2.3, mild hyponatremia, and normal BUN and creatinine. He had a multiple elevation at 5.3. His mixed venous was 59 with a normal lactate. His EKG on presentation here, he, he was actually just uh, by the paste at 80 beats per minute. His hospital course here, we attempted to wean the lidocaine drip, but it was unsuccessful due to recurrent monomorphic VT. And unfortunately, he had failed ATP from his device and his um, rhythm degenerated to VF with the device failing to rescue and he needed external defibrillation. He then underwent an EP ablation, in which they found three sine wave type ventricular flutters and another VT that appeared to be his clinical by the apex, which was also, which, which, which was then ablated. However, given the multiple morphologies induced, progressive cardiomyopathy was thought to be the underlying driver. And hence then he had a cervical ganglion block and he was listed status two for heart transplant. Unfortunately, one morning, just after sign out, um, he developed VT 160 beats per minute that quickly degenerated into VF. Uh, CPR was obviously performed and um, what lidocaine bulls was given. He was externally defibrillated to a paced rhythm. And he was alert at the time and was moving all extremities. How about 40 minutes later during nursing report, he was going to be aphasic, had a right facial droop and a flaccid right side. And so we called a coach stroke. He was taken to CT emergently and the large thrombus was seen within the left internal carotid artery terminus that was extending to the proximal left MCA. His INR is elevated, so he's not a candidate for TPA, but he was taken um, pretty emergently to near IR for thrombectomy. And this was his angio, it's a sagittal view um, during the near IR 
procedure. You see here his MCA and ACA were pretty much not present. Then after revascularization, um, when they took out the clot and they had you know, restoration of his uh, uh, vessels, and this is the ACA here, and this is the MCA on the left side. Um, M MRI, uh, brain post thrombectomy, he had a small left basal ganglion infarct without any hemorrhagic conversion. And he was surely exhibited following the MRI and following command and very oriented and with minimal residual deficits. And then we got an echo later that afternoon in which um, he had a large LV thrombus um, that was measured about 1.4 centimeters as you guys can see here. So he remained in CCU status two before undergoing a heart transplant a week later with a hep C donor. He was extubated a day after his transplant, and then he was started on hep C treatment while in an inpatient. He was transferred to the floor a few days later and discharged two weeks after his heart transplant. So I want to use this case to illustrate a unique case of inherited cardiomyopathy called PRKG2, which is often underrecognized cause for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that is characterized by ventricular preexcitation, supraventricular arrhythmias, and cardiac hypertrophy. And pre-excitation, as a reminder on EKG, is that manifested by a short PR interval, which is less than 120, a widened QRS, greater than 100 milliseconds, as well as a delta wave. And so when initially, when familial hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or AFHC, was initially genetically investigated, it was found to be an autosomal dominant disease that was mapped to four genetic loci. So one is the cardiotroponin T on chromosome one, beta cardiac myosin chain on chromosome 14, alpha tropomyosin gene on chromosome 15, and then another locus on chromosome 11. And at the time, no patients with these mutations at these loci have diagnosed WPW, although five to 10% of patients with AFHC have ventricular pre-excitation, indicating that perhaps there's a separate entity that encompassed both. Interestingly, the earliest association between ventricular pre-excitation and AFHC was noted in 1960s by Braunwald when he suggested that abnormal ventricular activation can result in regional myo myocardial hypertrophy and that the localized hypertrophy may disrupt normal cardiac electrical discontinuity at the AV ring. However, the relationship between WPW and familial hypertrophic cardiomyopathy was investigated formally in 1995 study with members of a large family who had both pre-excitation and AFHC. And with that study, it was uh, this gene was mapped to a chromosome on seven, and it became the fifth genetic locus for familial hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and the first locus for WPW. And this was a pedigree from, from the original study in 1995. It's a four generation family. Um, the circles indicate like female and the squares are male. The left shaded um, are patients who had AFHC, and then the, the right shaded are the ones who had VPW, and then the closed circles have both. And interestingly, um, domestic pre-excitation, they use Holters and they use adenosine challenge. Um, and the adenosine challenge, I read about this, is a rapid, when they use a rapid bolus of adenosine in a graded dose until physiologic AV conduction was induced. It's a positive test when the EKG monitoring showed increased ventricular pre-excitation indicating that you know, it's going through an accessory pathway. It's negative when complete AV block was observed without ventricular pre-excitation and then indeterminate when they didn't see any changes in AV conduction or QRS morphology. And hence, and then they use a language analysis with this family uh, performed on the DNA, which then led to the mapping of the, uh, to the chromosome 7Q3. And then six years later in 2001, um, they were able to identify the specific gene, um, mutation in that gene, which they found to encode the gamma-2 subunit of the AMP-activated protein kinase, um, also known as PRKG2. Uh, it was uh, found to be a missense mutation that resulted in the changing of, of amino acid from arginine to glutamine. And they did this study with using two families uh, with inherited WPW and cardiomyopathy, and they found that this gene was inherited in an autosomal dominant pattern with complete penetrance and variable degree of expression. And today, over 20 mutations have been associated with this syndrome. Um, and this is a quick diagram about what this AMP activated protein kinase uh, does. So this is a uh, diagram of a cell. Here you have the plasma membrane at the top, and then you have the nucleus on the bottom left. 
So when there's an elevated AMP to ATP ratio, the protein kinase is activated by both direct AMP binding and phosphorylation by this AMP activated protein kinase. It has diverse function after activation, um, including inactivation of non-essential ATP consuming pathways, regulation of the activity of creatine kinase, increased fatty acid oxidation, and then it may also even migrate to the nucleus and upregulate gene transcription. So how does that translate to the actual pathophys of the cardiomyopathy? So this AM kinase is, in, is encoded by this gene that's present in both cardiac and skeletal muscle tissues. And it regulates key metabolic pathways in muscle, particularly glucose metabolism. And then it may even also regulate activity of certain ion channels in cardiac tissues. And the, the missense mutation in this gene activate this protein kinase. And so the mutant cells may be inappropriately sensing a reduced ATP environment, which can lead to a focal deposition of amylopectin, which then leads to development of bands of glycogen-filled myocytes in the anglose fibrosis, which normally insulates the atria from the ventricles, hence resulting in accessory pathways. And then in human myocardial cells um, that's been differentiated from these uh, the stem cells that have this mutation, it was shown that the activating mutation regulates the RNA transcripts to increase glycogen storage and oxidative metabolism instead of glycolysis. And in comparison to the typically thought sarcomeric HCM, uh, there's a lack of myocardial fibrosis um, and, and the mouse model showed decreased TGF beta signaling. And that's important because this annulus fibrosis, the, the tissue, um, the band of tissue that insulates and prevents direct um, electrophysiologic con connection between the atria and the ventricle kind of develops embryonically in response to the signaling. Additionally, this mutation may also slow um, sodium channel conduction and prolong the action potential duration. And this schematic kind of um, generates uh, the overall picture of this. It's a, from a 2016 study that's done using the induced peripotent stem cells and what this mutation um, can do. And so it increases glycologen and decreases glycolysis. Um, it does increase cell viability through this AKT signaling. And then as well as we talked about the TGF um, beta signaling, it decreases uh, that signaling and decreases fibrosis as, as a result. On, on histology, um, on pathology, what we see in, in patients with this mutation, on the left, you see an H and E staying of normal myocardium, whereas on the right with this um, uh, cardiomyopathy, you see the vacuolization in the, in the myofibrils because of glycogen storage as shown by the arrows here. So this clinical syndrome, um, it's relatively rare. It's early onset autosomal dominant inherited disease. Um, as we talked about before, it's a syndrome of ventricular preexcitation, um, supraventricular arrhythmias and cardiac hypertrophy, and some also acquire chronotropic incompetence and heart block. The prevalence of it, um, one study showed um, state about 1% of HCM patients had this um, syndrome, whereas another said about 30% among subgroup with who had LVH and pre-excitation on their EKG. And what do you see on the EKGs? Um, ventricular pre-excitation is the most common. Um, you also see LVH, uh, as well as bundle branch block, mainly right bundle branch block. High degree AV block is also common. And in one study, there's a 100% penetrance for EKG abnormalities by age 18. And these EKG changes tend to change over time. However, changes over time are not necessarily associated with echographic progression of the disease. And EKG can change over time to, to progress into complete AV block and changes in the right bundle branch pattern, sinus node disease with symptomatic bradycardia and or chronotropic incompetence, as well as QRS axis change. And this is a kind of a typical um, EKG finding in this cardiomyopathy in which you see there's um, L severe LVH, uh, short PR, as well as a delta wave. And here I'll show you a couple examples of EKG progression in patients. Um, and this one, this top one is from a 19 year old um, with this cardiomyopathy, you see um, he or she has LVH as well as a uh, short PR. And then nine years later, um, they developed an RSR pattern and left axis deviation. And on their echocardiogram, their max ventricular wall thickness increased from 14 to 17 millimeters. 
However, um, in a second case, um, and this is a EKG from a 28 year old female, in which she has IVCD and a slurred QRS upstroke initially at the top. And then seven years later at age 35, she had more diffuse um, T wave inversions and more widespread interventricular conduction delay. However, on her echo, her mean LV wall thickness was stable at 11 to 12 millimeters. In terms of echo findings in patients with this cardiomyopathy, um, almost all have hypertrophy that involves the left ventricle and often progressive. However, the pattern of hypertrophy can vary among families. It's more often concentric than asymmetric central hypertrophy. And that's based on the hypothesis that the degree of hypertrophy dependent is dependent on the degree of myocyte enlargement from glycogen accumulation. However, it is also possible to not have any hypertrophy as seen in one family that was um, studied, which had this disease in very early onset, um, but it's a different mutation um, in the same gene. So the mean maximum wall thickness can vary between 24 to 33 millimeters. You see restricted mitral inflow pattern um, and RV hypertrophy was also found in some patients. People have looked at strain uh, to see if you use strain pattern to try to differentiate this, hyper this um, cardiomyopathy from other HCM. And they found this potentially stripe pattern um, that could be more um, unique to this PRKG2 cardiomyopathy. And in uh, these examples from A through F, um, I'm not sure if you can see the, the numbers, but it's a uh, reduction in the global longitudinal strain from minus 16 in A to minus 12 in, in F, kind of uh, showing the progression of this cardiomyopathy. Cardiac MRI have also been looked at, um, and they found there are various findings based on different cohorts. However, all the studies were pretty small numbers. Um, one study had six patients from two families. Um, the MRI showed mostly eccentric hypertrophy, and with early disease, um, they saw more focal mid inferior lateral hypertrophy, whereas in advanced uh, stage, they saw a more diffuse pattern that was concentrated on the interventricular septum. And two out of the six patients had um, lake out lineum enhancement in the most hypertrophied segments. And then in another study with five patients, um, they all had actually concentric hypertrophy and the LGE was a little different um, area. That's from the prior study. And it's unclear if the presence of LGE is also an independent prognostic um, marker as in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And these are a couple examples of MRIs um, from uh, A and B. Uh, this is the, the, the black arrows point to areas of hypertrophy. And then C and D are um, the arrows point to the, the patchy um, lake alanine enhancement in those areas. So clinical manifestations, um, there's been a couple of meta-analysis looking at what are the prevalence of the symptoms in patients with this condition. Um, the following are based on a 2016 study um, that compiled to about, 100, about 200 genetically confirmed patients with 13 different gene mutations. Uh, most common are you're gonna have the supraventricular tachyarrhythmias, uh, mainly AFib and atrial flutter, and that's been reported in about 40% of those patients. Uh, conduction system disease is, is also very common, um, including high degree AV block and sinus node dysfunction. It's about 44% in this cohort. And, um, and most had obviously had a pacemaker placed. And in the conduction um, system disease invariably occurred in patients in their 30s or their 40s. Heart failure was reported in about 10% of patients. And then sudden cardiac death, a little under 10% of patients with the mean age of death at 30, about 33 uh, years old. And um, sudden cardiac death occurred both in the presence and absence of severe hypertrophy. And there's not enough data to kind of clearly define the pathophysiology of the sudden cardiac death, whether it be abrupt advanced heart block or VF. Um, in those with, who had EP studies, um, VF was only induced by high atrial pacing and not by ventricular extra stimuli. And this is a table from an, another study, another meta-analysis uh, done a year later uh, in a different cohort and about 160 patients and the clinical um, manifestations of this cardiomyopathy based on the various different mutations that they found. And the most common in red here are gonna be your ventricular preexcitation and then evidence of um, uh, hypertrophy. 
Um, interestingly, about a quarter of the patients are asymptomatic, um, and then about 40% have devices. So comparing um, this condition um, with other uh, WPW syndromes, in this one study in patients that had an accessory pathway, they compared uh, two groups, uh, one with the PRKG2 mutation, and then the second without the mutation. It's a pretty small study. The number is about 10 in each group. Um, and they found in group A, those with the mutation, 30% uh, had um, uh, hypertrophy, whereas 0% in the group without the mutation. And then, however, in the group without the mutation, um, a third of them had additional accessory pathways versus none in those with the mutation. And then about half the patients um, in, uh, in the group with the mutation developed complete heart block versus uh, zero in the other group that just had purely had accessory pathway without the mutation. And this is a, a brief list of differential cardiomyopathy that's associated with both WPW and, and um, or short PR. Uh, including this list, uh, there's a few lysosomal storage diseases as well as a mitochondrial diseases shown by the second half of the chart. What about extra cardiac manifestations? Um, although this um, cardiomyopathy um, and, and the mutations have mainly affect the heart. Some studies have reported systemic involvement, um, but not in the most common mu mutation. Um, other mutations have a prevalence of skeletal myopathy, about 15% in one study, and, and asparagine to isoleucine mutation. In terms of uh, management for this cardiomyopathy, there's not uh, particular guidelines for this specific um, PRKG2 cardiomyopathy and people generally follow the guidelines for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in terms of diagnosis and, um, and, and management, including um, you know, prompt consideration for transplant in patients who have progression or in-stage heart failure um, and uh, accessory pathway ablation and ICD implantation consideration. Um, because of the few number of patients with a specific con condition, there's not um, any specific guidelines in terms of how to triage or how to risk stratify those uh, higher risk for sudden cardiac death. Um, uh, what about potential reversibility? Um, there have been a few basic science studies that are, have looked into this. In transgenic mice, um, they found that suppression of the gene prenatally and early in life normalized the glycogen content in the cardiac myocytes and also prevented ventricular pre-excitation. And then another study where they used um, stem cells derived uh, cardiomyocytes, they used this addition of um, this activator metformin, um, which kind of eliminated the bioenergetic changes in the mutated cells, which could be indicating a potential avenue for therapeutic modality. Although to date, there've been no mutation specific treatment developed or studied in human subjects. So in conclusion, um, PRKG2 cardiomyopathy syn syndrome can be initially misdiagnosed as WPW and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. However, the timely diagnosis of the correct pathology is important as a disease has different natural history than the latter. Autos it's an um, autosomal dominant inheritance pattern and now with over 20 different mutations um, culminating in a glycogen storage disease that's manifested by ventricular pre-excitation and cardiomyopathy. Um, echo and then cardiac MRI may reveal findings specific to this syndrome. And then the management guidelines follow those of HCM with particular attention to conduction disease monitoring and treatment. So those are my references and I'm happy to take any questions. Hey Steph, it's Evan, uh, great talk, thanks. Um, I guess given kind of what you presented about the overlap of WPW and this cardiomyopathy, do you think there's um, kind of more of a role than we're currently kind of realizing in terms of doing genetic testing for patients that present with WPW but without other clinical manifestations, given the fact that some of the patients that you presented at least initially don't have like a severe cardiomyopathy when they present with WPW? Right. I, I think it does show that, you know, I think doing genetic testing would be kind of would be more important, especially in younger patients um, and those with more kind of evidence of familial cardiomyopathy. So, and, and I think the treatment and the management is, even though it's 
very similar. There is still nuances, um, and it'd be helpful for the you know to screen additional family members with this disease. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.